This year's Shangri-La Dialogue Asia's top security summit is kicking off in Singapore. After the absence of Chinese high-level officials for eight years, the attendance of China's Defense Minister General Wei Fenghe is attracting attention. Why is China now sending a top military official to the Shangri-La Dialogue? How will China shape its role in maintaining both global and regional security? And what can we expect from China-U.S. military talks that take place at the meeting? To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Mr. Rongying, Vice President and Senior Research Fellow at the China Institute of International Studies. We'll also speak via satellite to CGTN's their own anchor, Yang Rui, and to Colonel Liu Lin, Associate Research Fellow at the War Studies College of the PLA Academy of Military Science, who are also both currently in Singapore, and Richard Wides, political expert at the Wikistart Global Consultancy in Washington, D.C. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Li Xiuyan, sitting in for Yang Rui. All right, we want to go live to Singapore now, where our very own Yang Rui is at the venue hosting this year's Shangri-La Dialogue. He's there with a guest. Good to see you there. Yang Rui, should take it away. Good to see you, Chiu Yuan. I'm so happy to be joined here in Shangri-La by Senior Colonel Liu Lin. Hi, Liu Lin. First question, uh, other than uh, the first official visit by a defense minister from the PLA, eight years after uh, Mr. Liang Guangli and his predecessor came over, um, I'm very much concerned about why the two sides, Singapore and China, recently uh, announced jointly that they would move forward stepping up defense cooperation after a revised bilateral agreement is to be formalized by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So what can you tell us about uh, the importance of strengthening the male-to-male ties between China and Singapore upon this stage? Mm -hmm. uh, China and, uh, uh, has always been paying uh, attention to the uh, relationship, military relationship uh, with Singapore. In the past e several years, I think uh, the China-Singapore uh, military relationship has made uh, a lot of progress, uh, including pragmatic corporations like ship visits, uh, educational exchanges, and joint exercises. Uh, this time with uh, uh, Defense Minister Wei Fenghe's visit to Singapore, uh, he met with uh, the uh, Singaporean leaders, and he also visited the Singa one of the Singapore submarines. Uh, these arrangements, I, sh I think, that shows that the military mutual trust between China and Singapore has uh, enhanced, and both sides have sincere sincerity to further enhance the uh, military uh, relationship. Uh, I think. Mm, the two sides still has great potential to enhance the uh, bilateral military ties. Uh, for example, both sides agreed to expand the scale of joint exercises and to enhance the uh, uh, exchanges between military think tanks. Uh, well, uh, the acting Secretary of Defense, uh, Mr. Patrick Shanahan from the United States, uh, uh, would come over and pretty soon he's going to deliver. Uh, an opening speech uh, uh, after the reception dinner. Mm. That's the first uh, preliminary, very, without mm. exceptions, uh, of a very special honor for the uh, Secretary of Defense from the United States each year. Well, he is expected to further outline uh, the American strategy of having an open and free Indo Pacific strategy. Yeah. Can you brief us on what he could say in his uh, uh, keynote presentation about this strategy? Mm. Yeah, the U.S. has put forward the uh, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy in 2017. And since then, they have been adding substance to the strategy and trying to put it into practice. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, this strategy is a comprehensive strategy. Uh, and uh, the defense aspects is a very important part of it. It is, uh, uh, for some elements, it's an inheritation uh, of the previous uh, U.S.-Asia-Pacific uh, strategy, but there are some new points that are worth to be noted. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, highlighting of the uh, in India and uh, the role of India and the uh, Indian Ocean uh, the, the emphasis of uh, uh, the quadrilateral cooperation between U.S., Japan, India, and Australia. 
uh, and the uh, emphasis of uh, uh, letting the regional countries to have alternatives uh, to uh, promote their infrastructure uh, construction. Uh, so I, th I think this time uh, Acting Secretary uh, Shanahan uh, may further elaborate the U.S. Uh, plans to uh, implement the, the, uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, this, this will be a, not a brand new uh, strategy, but he will add more uh, concrete details to the uh, U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, uh, Indian uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi mm -hmm. made it very clear mm -hmm. a couple of years back, right here at the Shangri-La reception dinner, that India does not seek to antagonize a third party by adopting or by mm. integrating with the Indo-Pacific strategy. Mm. That's of course somehow referring to mm. uh, the mutual trust that's been developed between Beijing and New Delhi. Having said this, uh, let's look at uh, uh, the American efforts to have a sort of a offshore balancing. Mm. For example, uh, member states of ASEAN would find it very difficult to take mm. side. Is it true that the more of them are going to take the dual track approach? Uh, in security areas, they're mm. going to turn to the United States for the mm. umbrella to protect their stakes. But economically, mm. they would of course expect China to mm. invest more in, for example, their infrastructure as part of the maritime Silk Road mm. here. Yeah, I think the uh, small and the medium-sized uh, countries are watching closely uh, to the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. And uh, they are concerned if this strategy will cause the increasing strategic competition between U.S. and China. Uh, uh, for example, the ASEAN, they have uh, uh, concerns about the uh, development of the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, they are worried that uh, the ASEAN role may be marginalized uh, uh, with this uh, implementation of this strategy. Uh, and uh, they are also concerned uh, about the exclusivity of this strategy so that they may have to choose sides uh, between China and the, the United States. So uh, ASEAN now is trying to uh, formulate uh, its own version of the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, which they highlight uh, the principles of uh, cooperation, uh, transparency, uh, inclusivity, so that uh, they will continue to play a, a central role in the regional architecture. Uh, and they are also trying to uh, encourage the China and the U.S. to reduce tensions in this, air, uh, in this region. And they are encouraging both countries to have a cooperative uh, competition uh, and also coexistence in this uh, uh, region. Thank you so uh, much, Senior Colonel Liu Lin. Thank you. Chu Yuan, uh, right at this moment, uh, uh, Mr. Patrick Shanahan, the Acting Secretary of Defense from the United States, is meeting with his Chinese counterpart, General Wei Feng He, and their talk would definitely generate a lot of front page stories for media from around the world. We're going to see what's going to happen next. Back to you, Chu Yuan. No doubt that's going to dominate the headlines. Great to have you, Mr. Yang Rei, and many thanks to Colonel Liu Lin as well. So let me now bring in my studio guest, Mr. Rong Yu. As Colonel just mentioned, China is sending a strong team, A-list team, 54 members led by the country's defense minister. This is only the second time that China is sending its top military official to the Shangri-La Dialogue. Last time China did so was in 2011. Why do you think China is doing that now? I think I would possibly have to make clear, if we follow the uh, spokesperson of the PLA, I think uh, he made it very clear that uh, uh, over the past uh, years, uh, the Chinese uh, government, the Chinese uh, military, has been attaching quite a lot of Im uh, importance to the Shangri-La by uh, reaching out to uh, uh, to meet their, their colleagues, to explain the policies, and so on and so forth. Uh, it is true that uh, the last time when China sent its, uh, its uh, defense minister was eight years ago, but in between. Uh, we had uh, quite high-ranking officials uh, like the le lieutenant general levels, deputy uh, chief of staff, which is a pretty high level. And uh, so, but but uh, having said that, I think uh, 
uh, as we have just discussed, uh, I think the uh, uh, Defense Minister Wei Fenghe is also, I mean, paying a visit at the invitation of a Singaporean host. So definitely, I think it is a strong message. It's an indication that the Chinese military, Chinese people. The PLA is very much uh, confident, mm -hmm. is very much, I think, uh, sort of uh, uh, ready to explain, to, to talk with his colleagues, to, 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 to share their views, and more importantly, to play a role that uh, help uh, by working together with the, their colleagues for, the, for maintaining peace and stability in the region. And the timing of audit is obviously interesting with the high tension between the U.S. and China. Uh, front and center on everybody's mind. Let me now bring our guest from Washington, D.C. also into this, Mr. Richard Ways, joining us via satellite. Sir, how do you look at it? How will it go down? Uh, how will you expect U.S. to engage with China at the Shangri-La Dialogue? Will we see more China bashing or not so much? You know, that's, that's the interesting question. I think the two previous studio guests uh, really emphasize a lot of continuity. So the uh, first uh, person emphasized, talked about the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy and so mm -hmm. on, but there's not much new there compared to what the, for example, the Obama administration was doing its last few years. And then it's, I think that President Xi, since he's come to office, has shown much more interest in these kind of military-to-military -military dialogues. So maybe a decade ago, two decades ago, they were very much on or off. Whenever one side did something to upset the other, they would suspend the dialogues. Uh, in the last few years, China has made a much more consistent, much more comprehensive effort to promote these kind of military engagements. Mm -hmm. But as your question rightly asked, the mystery is, what is the U.S. going to do about China? That's the one policy that's very much in flux. And so it's going to be very interesting to see when they go through their numerous disagreements if they're able to resolve any. Right. And a meeting between acting U.S. Secretary of Defense Shanahan and Chinese Defense Minister Wei Fenghe is also set to take place on the sidelines. And Richard, what would you expect for China-U.S. military talks during their meeting, a possibly bilateral meeting? What do you think they're going to talk about when they fa meet face to face? Right. So I think we've seen this in the lower level dialogues. There have been uh, several issues that uh, keep on occurring. I think we all understand them, which is you know, Taiwan, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the U.S. military ties with Taiwan, Freedom of Navigation Acts, uh, the South China Sea issue, uh, perhaps regional security issues. Sometimes they talk about Afghanistan, for example. They may talk about uh, Korea. Oh, I'm sure they'll talk about Korea, but they may talk about Iran. Some other questions I'd be interesting to know if they talk about. As you know, the U.S. is now trying to bring China into the arms control structure that the U.S. has had with Russia for the past several decades. Um, and, and China has resisted, but maybe they'll talk about some kind of alternative strategic stability talks. So mm -hmm. there's a lot to talk about. A whole host of questions. Now, Mr. Ramon, Shanahan once sa said on Wednesday that trade runs on separate track, that it won't spill over to the discussions on defense. Do you think that is possible? Well, I'm not sure whether it's possible, but I, it is always good, I think, for military, uh, for Pentagon officials like to say that. They would like to, by saying that, I think it seems that they are, try, they are trying to send a, a signal that they, they want to continue to uh, have a stable, mm -hmm. sort of a normal male to male relationship. By the way, that has been very much important, and it has been asked by the U.S. side, for the, if you look at the past decades of, of military sort of engagement between the two armies. So I, I think, but of course, the past uh, few years have seen that the U.S. side has making a lot of uh, provocations. I mean, the fun up certainly the one, and the question of Taiwan, the, uh, the arms sales to Taiwan and others. And more importantly, I think this is a very good opportunity, certainly, um, even though more symbolism, I mean, for the two military to sit together, uh, uh, I mean, to, 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 to share their, their views and see if they can uh, find a way to manage the relationship so that the, uh, 
uh, trade war or trade disputes would not spill over to provoke a real war between two mm -hmm. militaries. That would be a disaster. But the most, uh, the other important thing is that, of course, see the two military I and mean, uh, two can still work together to manage. I mean, uh, other uh, sort of uh, issues uh, for for regional and global security. This is also very much important. Mm. But I think uh, to have a continued sort of uh, uh, cooperation and uh, engage engagement and the U.S. military really have to show sincerity and show respect and uh, follow this sort of the spirit that, uh, uh, that that help the two military to work out their differences mm -hmm. and to for constru in a constructive way. What are your thoughts on this, Richard? Will the trade dispute and U.S. ban on Huawei further complicate the defense talks? No, that's a, a really uh, a, a interesting question. Um, and in, in, in a, if you're a military person, you would, head of the Pentagon, for example, you probably would want to try and focus on just the military questions because there's so many and so complicated, and you really can't do anything yourself about uh, many of these trade issues. But something like Huawei, is the, the, the U.S. objections have been n somewhat economic, but largely on national security grounds, that it's important that the U.S. control its infrastructure because of its, uh, the connection with information technology and, and military forces, command and control, satellites, and so on. So they may be able to keep them separate this weekend at Shangri-La, but I think overall it's hard not to see the tensions in these other areas spilling over to affect the military dialogue. And Richard, our guest, Colonel Liu Lin, has just mentioned that the U.S. is there to present its Indo-Pacific strategy, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. How do you look at this? This concept is not, you know, China doesn't feel very comfortable with. So how do you look at it? Is it strategically viable? Well, you, the, you, the, uh, there are two, I guess there are t uh, two puzzles. I mean, at the basic level, sure, it makes sense. This is something that uh, people understand Asia has become more important, and it's important for the United States to go beyond its bilateral t alliances with South Korea, Japan, and other countries and try and put them in some kind of network uh, with multilateral structure. But as, as you mentioned, uh, the, some, uh, many of the other countries, because of their strong trade ties with China, mm -hmm. uh, are reluctant to become too closely affiliated with an anti-Chinese uh, uh, military alliance. And there's also the challenge that the administration itself is, is a, still rethinking what exactly this strategy means in terms of what policies will result. So it, it could lead to some major changes, but still I think it's a bit too early to see what will happen uh, this weekend. And Mr. Rohn, how would China react to this new strategic reality? I think China made it very clear the, uh, the region as a whole has undergoing dramatic changes. And uh, I think there are a lot of uh, shared interest and uh, concerns that how to manage these security challenges, both traditional and non-traditional. While the United States has been certainly I mean, one of the major players, and has been played a very important role by, uh, I mean, it's with its military uh, uh, alliances. And in the meantime, there are other forces and other countries that also have their views and their initiative to how to promote a kind of a cooperative uh, uh, security sort of uh, uh, mechanism that would be equally important to, to help maintain that. So you would, would find a, a one version or one initiative put forward by U.S. with so-called the, the, the uh, Indo-Pacific either ver vision or, or initiative or strategy. There are other countries like China who, which has been advocating a, a common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security. And there are still others like uh, Russia uh, looking for a comprehensive security. And India, interestingly, as Colonel Liu said, that is also having its own vision of uh, Indo-Pacific, which largely, I mean, uh, what was last year actually by, um, uh, put forward by Prime Minister Modi, that it's more it's a geographical concept. And ASEAN, Last but not least, it also would, uh, has worked very hard to put their version, vision of uh, uh, Indo-Pacific, which is very much focusing on the centrality of ASEAN. So here we have uh, such a, so many 
mm -hmm. so that visions and uh, initiate. But the most important thing is whether they will be inclusive or exclusive, whether it's going to really help manage the, these uh, challenges and to promote peace and stability, but more importantly, that the weather is going to bring stability or bring trouble to the region. So this is, I think, a very interesting period, and this is certainly will be a big issue, big topic for a forum like that. Right, and a lot of Asian nations kind of feel they're caught in between, right? As mentioned by Richard a little earlier, they have now developed closer ties with China economically, but they also rely to various degree to the United States and security issues. Do you think that what we're at now will change all the calculus with a full-blown trade war between China and the U.S. and China and U.S. bringing this Indo-Pacific strategy? Yeah, that's the least that I think these ASEAN countries and other countries in the region would like to have. Uh, look at the uh, recent uh, uh, meeting in Tokyo. I mean, the uh, ASEAN leaders like Prime Minister Mahadeo and also I think the uh, uh, official, high-ranking official from Singapore and others, they all made it very clear they don't want to I mean, put in a position to feel that they would have to choose between U.S. and China. And they all call upon at various degrees that the U.S. should adapt adjust to the reality, adapt to itself, to the fact that the U.S. was not, I mean, able to continue like a sole superpower. They have to accept the reality in the one day that there are other countries like China and others will, can, will play a very important role. So this is, I think, the, the, the situation. I think uh, the, 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 the time that the U.S. And should listen, I mean, to carefully, not by provoking uh, trouble or creating tension so that the U.S. is now perceived that they, they could benefit from that, mm -hmm. uh, so that they will continue to maintain its so-called uh, supremacy or preponderance mm -hmm. position on the region, and by, I mean, provoking security. What the, uh, the, the country in the region would like to have is stability and prosperity, not security, and not, certainly not, I want to uh, put in a position and choose either U.S. or China. Mm -hmm. I'll also talk about Taiwan. This is another issue that's gotten China on edge. Richard, you earlier mentioned that when the two defense ministers meet, they will probably talk about issues including Taiwan. And earlier, the former U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter said that Taiwan was part of Washington's Indo-Pacific strategy network. How important is Taiwan in that strategy? Well, the, uh, I mean, Taiwan has historically been important in that it provides, for example, a uh, close uh, in support for U.S. military operations near China. It can allow for uh, radars and other sensors to be based there. But, of course, there have always been limits on what direct military presence would be in, in Taiwan or our joint activities. This administration seems to be refine, re, redefining that role somewhat, and perhaps expanding Taiwan's role in the Asia-Pacific structure. Um, and, but as you mentioned, there's a lot of resistance in China, and then there's also some uncertainty over the future of Taiwanese domestic politics. So if they elect a different uh, government uh, in coming years, I, I'm not sure many of the recent changes will be, would be sustained. But what do you think the United States is prepared to do with Taiwan? Well, the declared policy is that the, the, the U.S., while recognizing Taiwan as part of China, uh, would defend Taiwan from aggression from a foreign, uh, you know, from, a, from, from any, from any uh, actor. Uh, so, in principle, if China, although I don't expect this, if, if the, the, the mainland decided to invade uh, Taiwan, the U.S. would, would defend it. Um, sh short of that, I think it's more a question of taking advantage of having a, 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 an entity in the Pacific that wants to be part of a U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy uh, along with other countries such as Japan. Hmm. Now, the United States policy toward Taiwan, its action towards Taiwan has gotten China on edge, has angered China, 
The defense ministry spokesperson Wu Qian has responded, saying that U.S. quote is playing fire in supporting Taiwan, trying to use Taiwan to control China. Uh, how do you look at it? Do you think that it's possible that this could become a flashpoint in U.S.-China relations? Indeed, I think Taiwan that has always been a very the actually most important and sensitive issue between U China and the U.S. Forty years ago, when uh, China and the U.S. I mean decided to is establish diplomatic relationship, and be the, the negotiation before that, the one of the major sticking point is the question of Taiwan, and there between. Uh, there are three uh, China and the U.S. There are three uh, uh, joint communiques in which the United States clearly committed. I mean, on the question of, uh, of Taiwan, and so it's very unfortunate. And it is indeed the U.S. is playing with fire. On, I mean, by trying to make an attempt to uh, 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 capitalize the issue, thinking that they will be able to uh, uh, to put pressure. Or, or on China, which is totally wrong. And if you look at the uh, the, the trajectory of the, the, of the relationship between China and the United States, when the Taiwan question, the Taiwan issue is properly managed and handled, the relationship would be stable and strong. When the question of Taiwan becomes a problem, source of problem, and then will be tension. There will be tension not only for the relationship, but the term for the region. So that's why I think China has made it very clear, and this is a very important issue, and the United States know very well, and that's very unfortunate. I think it's very problematic for the Trump administration trying to play up these issues. It's indeed, I think, it's playing with mm -hmm. fire. Now, General Wei Fenghe is also scheduled to deliver a speech on June 2nd on China and international security cooperation. This is a highly anticipated speech. Richard, over to you. What do you think? What do you expect him to use this opportunity to address? What kind of information will you be looking out for? Right. I had the opportunity to, her to hear the minister at a security conference in Moscow uh, last uh, month. And so I'm think I think it will probably hear the same kind of themes. Um, he talked a lot about China's decision to develop military ties with other countries, its desire for a win-win you know, solution to regional security problems, uh, strong UN, strong international law. But there are a lot of uh, 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 criticisms, uh, not, over, uh, not a name, but I think I understood them as being of U.S. policies talking about you know, China wants to promote development, others want to promote conflict, and, and so on. So I suspect he'll do the same kind of speech, general affirmation of Chinese goals and vision in the world, but then criticism, particularly U.S. policies. Um, and he did mention Taiwan last time, and I'm, I would expect him to mention Taiwan on this occasion as well. We'll closely watch those final remarks goes to you. What can we expect from the defense minister? Well, indeed, I think since this is uh, the uh, uh, plenary session and that uh, sort of exclusively devoted to uh, Minister uh, Wei and definitely it is a very good opportunity for him to explain in details of China's security policy and China's views on how to promote regional cooperation and regional stability. And China as a major player in the region and China will continue to play a constructive role in promoting military-to-military uh, uh, -military cooperation, promoting peace and stability. And China has always been that. And China is also ready and, and more importantly, I think, to consistently to uh, promote, take the road of peaceful development. So China is a peace, a, pe a force. Uh, for peace and for stability. All right. Appreciate your insight, Mr. Rongying, and many thanks to you. Richard Wei is joining us from Washington, D.C. And that's going to do it for this edition of Dialogue on CDTN. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.